to submit questions at any time using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen in Zoom. And with that short remark, I turn it over to my GGA colleague, Stephen Buchanan-Clark, who will set the stage for our panelists, and you'll see them listed in your materials. Stephen. Thanks, Bethany. Um, welcome, everybody, to this webinar. Um, my name is Stephen Buchanan-Clark. I head up the Human Security and Climate Change Program at Good Governance Africa. We're an NPO with centers in Johannesburg, Accra, Lagos, Dakar, Addis Ababa which seeks to improve governance across the continent uh, through targeted research and policy development. Before I begin, um, I'd really like to thank uh, Resolve, Bethany Began and her team um, in particular for um, co-hosting this with us and for all the work they've done behind the scenes. Um, and as well as uh, the esteemed panel who I'll introduce um, shortly, um, as well as everyone joining today. Um, so over the last couple of years, GGA has produced an anthology series on the topic of violent extremism in Africa with contribu contributions from a variety of experts in their respective fields, two of whom will be on the panel today. Um, the, go uh, the goal of these, this anthology was to understand the mul multifaceted challenge of violent extremism and its profound implications for peace, security and development on the continent. Um, one of the central things that, that, are, that arose during our research and from the last um, book published was that across the continent, we are seeing an increasing spillover of conflict, crime, and violence across borders, both by internal factors, both due to internal factors such as poor governance, social and economic marginalization, as well as external factors such as shifting geopolitical interests and competition between powers, the flow of arms, fighters, and illicit financial streams and extremist ideologies across borders. More than ever, we need enhanced regional and international cooperation to address these complex peace and security challenges. Um, with the increasing internationalization of conflict and crime, political stability should be viewed as a global public good and is in the best interest for all. Mozambique is a case in point. Over the last three years, we have seen an escalating insurgency, which has already claimed the lives of around 1,500 people and displaced another 310,000. Which, and the conflict has major political, economic, and security implications for the wider region. So the objective of today's webinar is to unpack some of the transnational drivers of crime and conflict along Africa's eastern seaboard and look at how these factors intersect with local, political, economic, and social grievances in northern Mozambique. We hope this discussion will go some way towards informing better collaborative security policy which really appreciates both the internal and external drivers of conflict in the region. Um, thanks again for joining us. Um, as mentioned, we will have four, uh, three presentations today, followed by a, um, a discussant. Um, to start off will be Richard Shellen. He's a researcher at Institute for Security Studies in Johannesburg. Um, his presentation will uh, be looking at the organized crime nexus in Africa with a particular focus on East Africa. This will be followed by Charles Gorodema. Um, he'll be looking at what we know and what we should know about what sustains violent extremism in the Horn of Africa. Uh, this will be followed by Alistair Nelson. He was at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime and coordinator of Resilience Fund for Mozambique. And then we have uh, Dr. David Matsina, the Southern African Head for Amnesty International is a Lucifer researcher and done extensive work on researching peace and security in uh, and humanitarian issues in Northern Mozambique. Um, thank you. And I'd like to get things going by handing over to our first uh, panelist, uh, Richard Shellen. Rich. Thanks, Steve. Um, thank you, everybody. Well, um, great to be part of the panel. Great to be part of the discussion and looking forward to the broader discussion um, after the presentations. Um, so basically for me, it's, um, as, as Stephen has just mentioned, is to look at the link between terrorism and organized crime. Um, why organized crime? Because terrorists need funding. And like any organization, terrorist groups, um, extremist groups um, need funding to survive. Um, whether it be in form of money, whether it be in form of goods, whether it be in form of shelter, um, and uh, the debate on terrorism or violent extremism has always been focused on, you know, the, the distinction 
between what, what differentiates a terrorist from a criminal, very often it's, it's often both. So, so my aim is basically to look at what, what is this terrorism organized crime nexus? It's, it's become almost like a catchphrase, a cliche um, referred to as a nexus. Um, so it will basically, this presentation will look at what, what it means uh, broadly, uh, what are the challenges with, with the nexus uh, as um, a theoretical concept, and also what does that mean in, in, in reality? Um, to start off, organized crime and terrorism have traditionally been perceived as two distinct concepts in terms of their definitions. And what differentiate both is the motivation of the individuals involved in these groups, whether it be a terrorist group or an organized criminal network. Um, and uh, we've started to see in the past five years or so that the UN have also started getting on board and realizing that you know, terrorism cannot exist without organized crime. Um, we've seen the likes of Al-Shabaab, we've seen the likes of um, Akim in, in North Africa. These, these are uh, groups that has perfected the art of you know, organized crime and terrorism within their ideals. Um, for instance, in Resolution 2482 of 2019, uh, the UN Security Council expresses its concern uh, the terrorists can benefit from organized crime, um, whether domestic or transnational, as a source of financing or logical, uh, logistical support, uh, among others. Um, well, this is not new because, I mean, in terms in Africa, if we look at our legislation and protocols, we have the 2004 Protocol of Alger Convention, which looks at the links between terrorism and organized crime, but at that time it was mercenism. Um, basically looking at weapons of mass destruction, drug trafficking, corruption, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but one of the challenges that, that policymakers face, I mean, in, in, in the literature, if you look at the theory, if you look at um, scholars, it's, it's, it's well defined. Uh, we have, you know, the concept of narco-terrorism, we have the concept of um, crime terror continuum made famous by scholar Tamarenko, uh, Makarenko, Tamara Makarenko. But um, in practical terms, when you have to deal with it on a local level, a regional level, in policy terms for government, you, you face some challenges. And one of the main challenges that government and stuff face is the definition of organized crime and the definition of terrorism. Um, there is no set definition for terrorism. Um, different regions, different continents, different countries have different, um, for instance, the definition of terrorism in, for the UN is different to the definition of terrorism in SADC. And the same applies to East Africa. And in turn, this leads to difficulty in formulating policies which can be implemented to deal with the challenge posed by the two. Um, theoretically, the distinction between terrorism and organized crime um, lies in the respective objectives and modalities. Um, in simple terms, terrorists seeks political change through violence uh, or the threat of violence, and this is based on an ideology. Um, organized criminal groups uh, traditionally have no interest in influencing or affecting public opinion uh, or political change, but are rather interested in uh, material uh, situation or personal financial game. In other words, you, it's the ideology versus um, profit uh, debate that, that arises between the two. Um, and the legal level, um, the characteristic uh, being perpetrated by structured group involving serious national law offenses and transnational element, these two seems to overlap each other. Um, however, uh, we've seen the terrorist groups as I previously mentioned, often finance themselves and their operation through criminal activities, um, either directly or indirectly. And this will be discussed further by the panelists. Uh, at key examples, you have trafficking of arms, um, human trafficking, drug trafficking, um, cultural artifacts, extortion, um, uh, illicit trade of natural resources, such as wildlife, uh, illegal wildlife trade, um, illegal mining, etc., and kidnapping for ransom. 
Um, having said that, um, let's, it would be interesting to see where does this origin of the nexus come from. It's not something new, it's not something that was developed um, by the UN. Um, it originated with the term narco-terrorism. These were the times in the 1970s and 80s where you have groups, uh, terrorists, I mean, criminal groups um, perpetrating uh, terrorist acts. Uh, these are mainly drug trafficking organizations in Latin America, and the term narco-terrorism was coined then. And uh, the term started getting bigger and bigger, starting getting developed and, and, and adopted in, in uh, scholarly research in international relations and politics. And um, then it came to Tamara Makarenko, who I previously mentioned, created this crime terror nexus continuum. Um, I know it's, it sounds all theoretical, and, 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 but there's a purpose to that, because if you look at most of the policies or all the policies that are related to dealing with the nexus, they are based on that theoretical framework of the nexus, which basically um, is, is a form of a continuum which has four basic um, points on it. At the first point, you will have alliances. Uh, alliances basically refers to the point where a terrorist group and an organized criminal network comes together and, and they form an, an alliance, uh, either through protection, as we've seen in, in the case of um, Al-Qaeda in North Africa or Akim, or, um, where you will have the terrorist groups, uh, ter terrorist members will provide protection for drug traffickers to carry the drugs from, uh, whether it be you know, from, one, from one country to the next. Um, and then you have the appropriation, where you have the use of each other's tactics where terrorist groups use organized criminal tactics in terms of you know, uh, getting involved in the various trafficking and uh, various uh, instances of organized crime. And then you have uh, organized criminal group using terror tactics as I previously mentioned. So appropriation, basically terrorist groups using organized criminal network to finance themselves uh, and organized groups using terror tactics to uh, benefit their enterprise. Um, convergence. Convergence is when you have a marriage of convenience, when they come together and, uh, uh, and they create an opportunity for each other. Uh, and then you, the last case is a transformation. Transformation basically looks at, um, you have uh, Al-Qaeda in North Africa, for instance, which uh, very originally started as a terror group trying to make political changes um, or radical change in Algeria, transforming into an Islamic state but eventually realizing and then needing finance. And uh, through the UN you know, Financing of Terrorism Act and all of the conventions um, that the, the funding was largely restricted to you know, trying to, to uh, appropriate organized criminal tactics such as you know, counterfeiting of goods and trafficking of drugs and the likes. But then eventually they started moving away from the ideology of, you know, um, trying to conquer, uh, make turning Algeria into an Islamic state into becoming more of a criminal organization um, that focused pre predominantly on kidnapping for ransom and drug trafficking. And, um, but oh, having organizing one or two attacks just in line with the ideology. Um, so the factors influencing the nexus per se, what makes a nexus function? Why, what makes it thrive? And basically it's the lack of governance. Uh, that's, that's a key point. Poor governance, but also a lack of thereof. And uh, that includes a state of chaos, protected conflict, and region that possess shadow economies. Basically an economy that function outside of the main economy of the country where criminals operate rather than where the state have little legitimacy or have no control whatsoever. Um, and that you will be and, and that is quite often seen in cases, you know, wherever there are such terrorist groups operate, Northern Mali, um, Somalia, uh, now in most recently the case of, of Northern Mozambique. Uh, and all of this brings down to, to the case of um, poor governance as a key. Um, as I previously mentioned, there are various typologies of uh, crime terror nexus which influences itself, such as um, terrorism and drug trafficking, that's a major one where terrorists benefit predominantly from drug trafficking, which is quite lucrative and it's prevalent all over the continent in various countries. 
and and um, you also find issues such as weapon trafficking, human trafficking. Um, a group, for instance, you have a group such as um, Al Qaeda in North Africa again, Al Shabaab. We've seen Al Shabaab um, dealing in sugar, charcoal. Um, we have a group like the ADF, for instance, who will deal in mining, who will control mining sites in the DRC, and also in illegal wildlife trafficking. Um, kidnapping for ransom is also quite a good source of funding for, for various terrorist groups until, most, until recently, when the, um, states and governments have agreed that they shall not pay ransom to terrorist groups. Um, exploitation of natural resources, like previously mentioned. This is quite key as we see it in the case of Mozambique, where you have exploitation of, of natural resources. You have not only trade in the wildlife, not only the drugs, but also um, mining and, and illegal mines and the likes. And um, another aspect is money laundering and illicit financial flows. Uh, contrary to beliefs, yes, um, terrorist groups do get involved in money laundering and, and international and illicit financial flows, which will be discussed further um, during this course of the uh, discussion. Um, so what? Um, having discussed this, um, why is it that the nexus is still thriving on the continent? Um, the main reason is that international and regional responses um, to organized crime terror nexus have remained limited in that they tend to focus on traditional terrorist activities. Um, in that, I mean the, the financing of terrorism. Um, basically, organized crime is seen as a funding mechanism uh, for terrorist group rather than part and parcel of the terrorist group mode of functioning. And, um, and very often responses are, are, are dealt towards the traditional aspect of it rather than tailoring it and acknowledging and addressing the nexus itself. Um, the other responses are primarily driven by law enforcement objective. Um, such responses are no doubt important, but however, they lack the strength in addressing root causes of the interlinked roles of criminal and terrorists. I think in, in any discussion on terrorism, you always have to go back to the root causes of, of that. What, what led to uh, the radicalization in that case of terrorist groups, but also what led to the shadow economy that terrorist group can benefit so much from organized crime and even uh, become organized criminal groups themselves. Um, one aspect that I will focus, I think, especially in, 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 in that failure of responses would be the, the financing of terrorism. Um, we, we've seen issues such as, you know, there's been responses geared towards the prevention of money laundering, and these are, are advanced and well documented. We have extensive guidance for financial institution, law enforcement bodies, global and national regulators, and even states to follow and oversee. However, these are more effective for the context where money is moved through an institutionalized financial system. Um, through a system of banking. When terrorist groups use the banking, then you can freeze their accounts and you can implement all the various money laundering, anti-money laundering initiative and the likes. But terrorists often do not use these traditional or these institutionalized financial systems. Um, for instance, you have reports from the FATF, which looks at, which says that the informal Hawala financial system, for instance, um, we uh, are major contributors to the funding of, of terrorist groups, um, especially also non-traditional means such as cryptocurrencies um, and even social media channels and networks. Um, during the research that I've done in, in the various parts of the continents on looking at the nexus, one thing comes clearly, uh, very often this crime terror nexus does not only function on um, pure currency or money per se, for instance, this the research that I've done have shown that you, you have exchange of products for weapons, um, motorcycles for arms, for instance, in uh, Burkina Faso. Research done in, in the DRC, in the, the ADF, look, sees how terrorist groups have exchanged gold for weapons or gold for food, um, drugs for weapons. And the question is how does, you know, the UN anti-financial regulation apply to that? How do you prevent that? Because this is also a source of funding. Um, 
terrorists need groups more than they need money. They need food more than they need physical hard cash currency. And through a system of exchange of goods, they get their system going and moving. But that doesn't go to say that um, anti-money laundering and all of that are not relevant. They are very much so because we've seen terrorist groups do use, make use of financial institution system, especially to transfer money overseas and the like. So it is very relevant, very important. But also there's, in addition to that, there's a need to look at the non-formal uh, aspect of that. And uh, also the another one is the lack of responses available to address the ability of local groups to extort or tax local population business and revenue flows. And these have been identified in various case studies as major means which um, uh, terrorist groups actually raise funds. So in conclusion, um, having said that, it, it's not, um, yes, the nexus is flourishing, terror groups are capitalizing on that, but it doesn't mean that law enforcement and other responses, government cannot be one step ahead. Um, the importance is uh, to understand what the nexus is, to understand what organized crime is, and also the responses uh, should not be dichotomized. Uh, very often you find like if you ask, you know, in the judiciary, for instance, which is easier, you, you arrest somebody on terrorism charge and you find that it's difficult to convict that person, but yet um, that person could be charged on organized criminal an organized crime um, legislation, for instance. And, and I think it is, requires an understanding in, in, in law enforcement, in the judiciary, and uh, also at the various government level where responses to organized crime terror nexus have focused larger on addressing issues relating to financing of terrorism and, and the likes. Um, but in the light of the evolving nature of the nexus, um, there is a need to develop effective and appropriate responses, such as understanding and uh, realizing that these two cannot be separated. And uh, bringing in also including, you know, looking at the factors as well, this cannot be separated, you can have a law enforcement, you can have a law enforcement, you know, approach, but also looking at what, how do organized criminal networks operate? Um, how does that and terrorist group function uh, and, and then aim at, at targeting that. And this can only be done, you know, both at the regional, national, and even local level based on strong evidence-based engagement with local actors, um, enhanced service delivery, and most importantly, the principle of good governance. Um, and with this, I, I end. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rick. Um, it's a really interesting um, presentation. And I think it, it frames the, um, the, the panelist presentation to come, particularly in terms of how, how policy relates to the, the nexus and how the different types of uh, funding streams used by extremist organizations. I think it, it, it leads us um, really well into Charles um who will present next. Um, on what we know and what we don't know about what sustains violent extremism in, in Africa, uh, with a particular focus on the work he's done in the Horn and how the uh, intersection of the nexus, which you discussed, um, relates to what's going on, I think, in um, northern Mozambique and, and, and countries within the Eastern Corridor. Thanks, Charles. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. <clears throat> and uh, thank, thank you to the Good Governance Africa and uh, the Resolve Network for inviting me to, to speak. Um, where I come in really is to um, try and draw some comparative lessons from what has been happening in the Horn of Africa, what is uh, happening now in Northern Mozambique. Uh, I gather everybody uh, listening will be familiar with the countries we are talking about uh, when we use the term Horn of Africa. But uh, allow me just to, in the interest of uh, just clarity so that we are on the same page. These are largely the countries that are bordering on the Red Sea uh, and uh, the Gulf of Aden, the Somali coast, 
uh, the greater one of Africa also includes uh, countries like uh, Uganda and uh, South Sudan, which are not necessarily coastal states. But uh, the lessons that I, 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 I'm going to uh, draw lessons to, to highlight uh, image from the greater one of Africa rather than just the coastal states. This is a very interesting sub-region, uh, a region that uh, for reasons of insecurity and underdevelopment has often been referred to as one of the world's most challenging regions. Now, there are two uh, issues that I would want to really be upfront about. The first is that uh, in spite of the frequently expressed relief at the decline of state-supported terrorism elsewhere in other parts of the world, for the Horn of Africa, the specter of state-supported violent extremism persists. This is driven in no small part by the fact that there is a certain continuity from what has happened in the past, uh, uh, countries supporting uh, proxy uh, conflicts in, in other, in, in bordering, in neighboring countries, but uh, it's also increasingly becoming quite prominent uh, with the real danger that uh, the fierce rivalry among the most powerful uh, Gulf states uh, is now threatening to exert itself on countries in the Horn of Africa region. The fear is that this rivalry uh, within the Gulf could spawn conflict in the Horn of Africa uh, at the instance of or as proxy conflicts between uh, the emerging powers in the Gulf. Uh, uh, we, 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 we have already or we are already seeing what is happening in, in Yemen, where in that conflict, some countries in the Horn of Africa are already getting involved and drawn in. Now, the, the, uh, there's a real danger that there are going to be more conflict that will actually uh, arise in the Horn of Africa at the instance of some of these powerful Gulf states. Uh, Richard has mentioned uh, something about the, the nexus, the dependence of uh, terrorist uh, groups on uh, raising funding through organized criminality. Well, the, that is very true. For the, 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 the Horn of Africa, uh, one of the lessons that uh, emerges from the experience there is that terrorist groups uh, require uh, to establish and rely on safe haven for conducting various commercial activities. Uh, and they require regions in which they can uh, either be involved in trading, illicit trading of commodities, or can in fact benefit from illicit trading which they themselves may not necessarily be involved in. So the whole uh, purpose of uh, uh, the activities, such as the ones that we are encountering in Northern Mozambique, clearing up areas and virtually engaging in uh, scorched earth policies, the underlying reason for that, as far as the terrorist groups are concerned, might well be that the intent to create this safe heaven in which they can conduct various commercial uh, activities. We, we, we certainly saw uh, what uh, Al-Shabaab uh, was able to do for a while uh, in respect of the port of Kismayo and the region around that. Uh, to a certain extent, they're still continuing some of these, some, of, some similar activities to a much lesser extent. In the Horn of Africa, there are many instances of attempts to create the self heaven in which to conduct various commercial activities or terrorist organizations. So that is, that is clearly something that uh, uh, 
uh, the Horn of Africa can perhaps sort of uh, uh, throw forward uh, as a lesson for, for, for what is happening in, in northern Mozambique. Then, uh, as far as the drivers of violent extremism are concerned, there are many similarities that can be drawn between the drivers of the conflicts in the Horn of Africa and what is happening in Mozambique. Uh, there is the large, the general factor of deficits and failures of governance, which looms very large in the Horn of Africa, uh, with uh, numerous and emerging um, in, uh, ethnic conflicts, border conflicts, uh, religious uh, stroke ethnic conflicts, uh, simply continuing to exist because the governance systems, governance structures have failed to in fact resolve some of these uh, uh, deficits. Uh, these failures, in fact, uh, apart from being the basic drivers, perpetuate the, uh, the, the, the specter of uh, violent extremism. Then there is also uh, the youth, uh, the, the youth uh, dividend, as it has sometimes been referred to, the high levels of population growth, high numbers of youth in the area, because of uh, the question of economies being continuing to be underdeveloped in the Horn of Africa, uh, the numbers of disillusioned youth uh, drifting between petty crime and gray area transient, transient subsistence activities continues to be a big and continuing problem. That youth uh, continues to provide um, uh, fertile ground for recruitment uh, of terrorist organizations. And that is a body of youth that is very susceptible to influences by political agitators. Now, the political agitators uh, who, in some instances, eventually develop into warlords, and we've seen this in the Horn of Africa, are themselves usable they can be exploited by these external powers, such as the states, the Gulf states that I've been uh, talking about. To mention them, the Saudi Arabia, uh, which uh, is in an alliance with the, uh, the Emirates uh, on the one side, uh, and then on the other side, you, you have uh, Iran, um, which is in a loose alliance with Qatar, joined occasionally by Turkey. It is quite considerable, and there are indications that in Ethiopia, for example, there's a real possibility that uh, uh, some of the Gulf states could, in fact, uh, align themselves against one uh, agitator or a number of agitators uh, against the incumbent uh, regime. Uh, so that's, again, another uh, lesson that uh, can be learned from what is happening uh, in the in the in the in the Horn of Africa. Uh, if I may move on to look at uh, um, what is it that makes the Horn countries vulnerable to uh, these drivers of conflict? Well, the scope for illicit activities to fi finance uh, violent extremism continues to be quite large. The commodities that can be traded uh, continues to be large because business is, formal business, registered business, is just not big enough to supply the demand for all the commodities that are required. Secondly, there is the question of corruption. Corruption, which is a universal problem everywhere, is an equally big problem in the Horn of Africa. Now, where you have so many uh, borders, many of them artificial, contested, uh, border management is a big issue. Borders uh, not only serve as frontiers for the control of uh, imports and exports, but they also provide opportunities 
for corruption, uh, corruption of the border management officials by those wanting to uh, trade in contraband through border, uh, border entry and uh, departure points. Some of this contraband is in fact usually in demand and highly marketable by terrorists. For example, uh, food substances such as sugar, uh, charcoal, which is exported across, motor vehicles, which are always in demand, uh, are also uh, pretty much a commodity that has uh, generated a lot of corruption uh, in the Horn of Africa. Another uh, factor of vulnerability is enduring ethnic and religious grievances, which occasionally manifest in intra-community friction. Certainly in countries like Ethiopia and Somalia, these are a big, big factor where you have a, almost, in the case of Ethiopia, an ethnic-based federal state system where the various ethnic group, groups occasionally jostle for uh, supremacy and to carve out greater uh, powers. Uh, these really, for Ethiopia at least, constitute a huge source of vulnerability to violent uh, extremism. The inability to absorb youth into formal employment, I think I've already said something about that, that continues to be a huge source of vulnerability for the Horn of Africa uh, countries. The undocumented movement of people across the region, again, that is a long enduring problem, partly because the borders are themselves artificial, but also, and importantly, because the level of development across borders uh, is so, there's such a huge disparity. Uh, people are always being attracted from lowly developed regions to higher developed regions. The higher developed regions might be in the same country, but quite often they are uh, across the border in different countries. Not in Mozambique will of course be quite familiar with this. Mozambique as a country will be familiar with this. People constantly moving to and fro, mostly in the direction of the higher developed countries, specifically uh, South Africa. Documenting these movements has proved to be a monumental challenge. And there's a source of vulnerability to terrorism and also to the funding of terrorism through resource flows, illicit flows of resources. Again, it's a big, big issue. Then there's the competence and capacity, the question of competence or capacity of governments in the Horn of Africa to impact on the participation of these foreign powers uh, on conflicts. That is very questionable. Even though it is a matter of record, and it is very well known that the role that is being played uh, that is being played by the likes of Saudi Arabia, UAE uh, on the one side, take Iran on the other, is likely to um, worsen the situation there. Uh, I'm not aware of uh, what is really being done by the regional organization such as IGAD, the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, East African Community, to rein in these external powers and in fact manage their involvement in the Horn of Africa so that it does not deteriorate to uh, a, 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 a stage where they become a big part of the problem of uh, terrorist financing or ter violent extremism in the, in the Horn of, uh, of, of Africa. And then finally, the, another the issue which might be of comparative interest for, for northern Mozambique is the, um, the question of uh, the capacity of uh, uh, the member countries of the Horn of Africa region to deal with illicit financial flows. That is very underdeveloped, uh, partly because there is no uh, unanimity of what is to be done, uh, even defining the nature of the problem and its connectivity or connection to violent extremism, to underdevelopment, and to just the general uh, continuation of uh, these difficulties is lacking. Now, because of that, 
they have yet to develop a common approach to stemming or curbing illicit financial flows. Without achieving that, the, the ability of these countries to mobilize enough financial resources to be able to impact positively on issues such as unemployment, border management, uh, level, leveling the playing field, equalizing the levels of development between the coastal regions and the hinterland. These are always going to be constrained. And uh, as a result, violent extremism will continue to be uh, an enduring challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charles, for that presentation. It re really fascinating. Um, I'm really glad you brought in the, uh, the topic of the uh, competing geopolitical interests in the Horn and its role in, in, in um, driving conflict. Uh, I think when we talk about illicit financing of uh, terrorist organizations, you know, people immediately think of the criminal elements, but we don't look at the at the role of, of states with, within that, either actively supporting terrorist organization or simply by looking the other way and letting illicit revenue streams run through their, their, their countries, their banking systems. You mentioned the UAE. I think they're the fifth largest trading partner to Mozambique and they were Priv Invest Bank, which is based in Abu Dhabi, um, is where the two, all the money of the $2 billion loan scandal in Mozambique went through. So they had definitely have a role to play in, um, and Dubai, of course, in, in monitoring illicit financial flows. Um, you also talked about some of the other important transnational drivers of conflict, um, migration flows, as we know, you know, um, Mozambique uh, lies along the, one of the major um, migrant routes from Ethiopia all the way down to South Africa. Um, and of course, and, and those are highly vulnerable populations um, to recruitment um, into um, uh, organized crime groups and violent extremist organizations. Um, and then you touched on, I think, some of the, the importance of uh, the intersection between poor governance and uh, transnational um, organized crime, how um, you kind of, one is uh, facilitated by the other. Um, I think that uh, also flows nicely into our, our next presentation by Alastair Nelson, um, who um, I think is going to uh, discuss some of his research in northern Mozambique in particular, um, wildlife trafficking, um, and how that intersects with um, poor governance in the region. Um, Alastair, over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, um, for the opportunity, and thanks, everyone, for attending. Um, so I'm going to use a PowerPoint, which I'll start shortly, but I really want to talk my talk is, is really based on sort of six years of living and working in Mozambique, um, supporting the government and helping to build national capacity to really tackle organized wildlife crime. And then the overlaps that we picked up around that, particularly in focus with a focus on Northern Mozambique. So that was sort of 2000 and um, late 2011, 2017. And then more recently, since I left Mozambique, some of the research I've sort of done looking at overlaps as well. And I'm very interested really in, um, in the link, so if I look at, um, I'm just going to try and get this open. So looking at this nexus or overlap between violent extremism and organized crime, um, what's of interest in this to me is that organized crime and, and, and how organized crime with co corruption is just an integral part of organized crime. You, the two exist hand in hand, how those actually break down structure in society which leads to the creation of the conditions for violent extremism. So organized crime later plays a role in funding violent extremism and they become interlinked as, as Richard spoke about. But, but what I saw happen in Northern Mozambique really was this breakdown in, in, uh, in governance, rule of law, structured society, which led to um, the conditions um, for people to become um, really frustrated and to leading, to, um, leading to violent extremism. So I'm going to whip through this as quickly as I can, and, um, and there can be questions afterwards, basically. Um, all right, so, um, so where I'm really going to start is, is that this, this area has a huge history on illicit trafficking or coastal trading, some of which was illicit and some which was illicit. Um, the economy of Cabo de Gado itself has been dominated by the illicit economy since um, the early 70s, really. Um, and that is as maybe is to be expected and is suddenly not working um okay 
sorry, everyone. Um, let's just see if I can make that share again. Um, otherwise, I'll just do it without the presentation. Um, the war economy really was dominated by new traders. So when Portuguese um, traders left off to in, in 1974, it was people who had money who were able to move in and, and dominate the trading system. And post-war, um, those people were able to open access to markets, um, and some of that was illicit markets. So the immediate um, high-value products were timber and access to the what would become future tourism sites. And that's where um, illegal timber trade um, and corruption around land grabs started to happen. Heroin trafficking through this area became important from really around the late 1990s that, that was first picked up. Um, and it's also important to realize that there's a long history of violence in, in Cabo de Gado, um, and Joe Hanlon really has, has um, covered this quite extensively. But it's based on, so the first, the, civil, the um, independence war started there. There's been a distrust of the elite and perceived inequalities um, there was election violence in, um, in Montepoeg in 2000 when 92 people were killed. There was election violence in Masimba de Praia, which was really based on that ethnic difference and conflict and inequality between the Makonda and the, and the Moani, which is playing itself out now um, in this violence extremism we see. There were lynchings in Mudumbe around um, a belief that the elite were, were tricking people, were coming in and, and as lions at night and killing people. There were cholera riots in 2009 in southern Cabo de Gado. So there really has been a long history of distrust, inequality, perceived, it might be perceived, it might be real, um, and violence in, in Cabo de Gado. If we look at the illicit economies over, say, the last 20 years, we've really seen um, heroin and more recently cocaine become major uh, um, illicit um, uh, uh, sources of illicit um, trafficking in that area. So more recently, there's been a diversification of markets and networks as well. So we originally, heroin trafficking was controlled sort of by elites who were, who were um, associated with the, with the ruling party. More recently, we've seen a real diversification of that. And so there's Zanzibari networks, a couple of them operating in northern Mozambique. Um, there are local Mozambican networks that have set themselves up um, rather than just um, Mozambicans of, of South Asian descent. We've also seen a growth and diversification of the local market. So heroin is now widely available in Pemba, in Montepoeja, and, and, and in a lot of the mining sites as well. Timber trafficking has changed over the last 20 years. So um, in the early 2000s, it was quite dominated actually by, by South Africans and other people from the region. Um, and we've seen a huge growth in Chinese influence um, in that as well. Wildlife trafficking really took off between 2009 to 17, um, when maybe 8,000 elephants were killed in Nyasa Reserve in, in northern Mozambique um, between about sort of 2011 to 15. Um, and huge volumes of ivory were trafficked out of there. And I think that played an, a major role in corrupting district level, low level officials, basically. Um, initially, that ivory was moved out through Tanzania. But later, we saw a major shift of other networks moving to Mozambique, and I'll cover some of those in case studies shortly. We also see human trafficking, which has been referred to. So people moving down from the Horn of Africa. So sorry, this should actually say human smuggling. Sorry, I got that wrong. It's human smuggling. So people who are paying to be moved from the Horn of Africa down to South Africa and potentially onwards. And one of the routes, once they get through Zanzibar, is down and on through the coast, basically. Um, and we see illegal gemstones and artisanal gold being moved out as well. So there's been, and there's major issues, which I won't go into around the, um, around the, the ruby mining and, and other gemstone mining in Montepoeja and the land grabs by the elite. Um, and then the, the, the decrees and the, and the regulations, which have basically made artisanal miners illegal. Um, the people who were from that land already and were, who were moved off it and feel that they've been completely dispossessed of, of um, a, a natural resource that should belong to them. Um, this is a map of showing the illicit trafficking routes in northern Mozambique. So this was from work that I, I did in um, December, January, really talking to, um, going back and talking to people that I'd worked with up there. Um, nothing to take from it except, <laughs> except just to show how complicated it is. Heroin, um, illegal timber, heroin coming in from, um, from the Makran coast of, of um, Afghanistan and Iran, but also secondarily the local use heroin mostly coming in from Tanzania, getting packaged in Dar and then moving down. 
um, and all kinds of other products, a lot of other products moving out, which I've referred to. to sh this map shows it actually in the region and showing how um, these, these trade routes, which I referred to, these ancient trade routes that still exist, um, how Pemba and Northern Mozambique fit into that. So those linkages to Zanzibar, to Dar es Salaam, and as far and across to the Comoros as well. And how's the flow of, of people, drugs, wildlife products, timber is all moves on those on those um, on those same coastal trade trading routes that have existed for millennia. Um, so the first overlap, I'm just now I'm going to whip quickly whip through some cases just to, to show some of the overlaps that we came across over the years. First overlap was um, further north in Kenya, the Akashas, who um, were a major heroin trafficking family, but were also implicated in illegal wildlife trade. In Kenya, they were implicated in, in moving up to 30 tons of ivory by owning a trucking company together with Faisal Mohammed, who was a major ivory trafficker in Kenya. Um, but in the covert recordings that were made in, the, in, in building the case against them, they also spoke of their links to ivory and rhino horn trafficking um, from Mozambique and how they access rhino horn from, from Mozambique. And this to them was just another product um, they could buy low and sell high. Um, next, interestingly, is the Shui Dong network, which is a Chinese network, which were established for 20 years or more, um, shipping uh, initially um, sea cucumbers out of Zanzibar, but then moved into ivory out of Zanzibar um, very well connected into Zanzibar um, family relationships for um, actually generations. There'd been this engagement between people from this area, from Shui Dong in, in southern China and Zanzibar. Um, and they really moved into Ivory in a big way um, in the sort of 2010 to 14. Um, and later in mid 2010s, uh, so 2015, 16, they actually moved their network down to Pember in northern Mozambique out of Tanzania because of law enforcement pressure in Tanzania and because of the how open they found Mozambique to corruption and the ability to move vast quantities of ivory. So they were actually bringing ivory in from elsewhere um, to, to uh, Mozambique and moving it out. And we see the same thing in the third case. So the Chroma network, um, this was a Ghanaian heroin trafficking network. Um, which later moved into trafficking ivory and became almost entirely an ivory trafficking network, now sending ivory back um, you know, the other way across their, their, their area of operations. They were based out of Uganda. They had operations that stretched all the way from West Africa through Central Africa to East Africa. And in around sort of 2015, 16, we saw them set up in Pemba and Mozambique as well. So um, they placed people in Pemba and Mozambique. They actually usurped one of the Chinese traders. Um, and they started shipping their ivory from Uganda down to northern Mozambique and then uh, in containers out from there. Um, they also, interestingly, when they moved ivory down, and so there was covert investigations work was done on this, this group, and they were eventually um, um, arrested and indicted in the Southern District of New York. Um, they were moving ivory on the, on the Dalles um, from Zanzibar down to uh, Masimba de Praia, Actually, on the 5th of October 2017, um, as part of this investigation, they were moving ivory into Masimba de Praia on a boat that had 91 um, people who were being smuggled down um, from the Horn of Africa as well. And they all arrived in there on the same day that, that the Al-Shabaab Al attack happened, uh, happened on, um, in Masimba de Praia. Um, and it was just, and on, those, on that same boat, there was, you know, one of the traffickers had um, on his phone, he had, um, he had beheading videos. So this... I'm not suggesting necessarily that they're the same people doing the same thing. What I'm talking about is the facilitation. You had this openness to move stuff, anything. And the facilitators who made that happen um, were often involved in all of those activities. Um, case four uh, that I'll quickly talk about is uh, Chupi Mateso, who was an ivory trafficker, uh, a Tanzanian ivory trafficker who operated in northern Mozambique. He ran away from the Tanzanian authorities for four years. What was really interesting about him is that um, we managed to support his getting arrested. He was arrested by Mozambican law enforcement authorities um, and then um, expelled back to Tanzania. And that decision was taken by the Attorney General of Mozambique, who, who was deeply aware of the depth and, and the, the extent of his corrupt networks that he, was, he had supporting him in northern Mozambique. And she said, we won't be able to try him effectively in northern Mozambique. We'll hold on, on immigration charges. You set up the Tanzanians to take him back and we'll expel him, basically. 
So that was a really interesting example to me of this breakdown in governance, this recognition of it, but at the same time, the ability to actually find Mozambican law enforcement officers that you could work with who isolated themselves from their units. Um, and you, we were able to affect this really, uh, so it helped support the government of Mozambique rather to affect this really important arrest. Um, so I'm gonna quickly cover the, what I think the reasons were for the law enforcement success. In all of those cases, all of those networks were broken and disrupted and dismantled basically. Um, this was because of long-term transnational investigations led by US authorities and Chinese authorities all of the, whom though, who worked in partnership with trusted national law enforcement authorities, you have to. Um, now I'm gonna quickly switch to um, the conflict and violence extremism in, as, as we saw it develop in, in Northern Mozambique. And, and there are many people who are far more expert at this than, than I am. But really, um, we first kind of came across the group in, in, um, in Balama and in Montepuej when, when we were looking at Somali ivory traders um, in 2011, really. And people were talking about this group that had moved out um, and we didn't, you know, we didn't really, we didn't, re didn't really focus on that. We were just interested in whether they were trafficking ivory or not. Um, but, but what local people spoke about was disenfranchised youth um, who, were, who were really fed up with declining governance, increasing corruption, and their future being stolen by the elite and by outsiders. Um, as um, um, Eric uh, Maria um, Jeannot has, has explained, this was in a re religious sect that was established actually back in 2017, um, 2007, sorry. Money came into that sect um, and um, youth were able to set up their own businesses. Some were engaged in illicit and some in illicit economies. As we understand it, some people got involved in timber trafficking and some may have got involved in, and to some extent in moving ivory, not major ivory traffickers. We haven't ever come across, heard of that. Um, some seem to have got involved in, um, in gemstone um, trading as well. Um, Eric describes very well how they turned to violence in 2017. Um, and so what we see really is a, is a local issue, a local problem, a local frustration with a breakdown in governance, rule of law, futures being stolen um, by youth in particular. Um, later, this, this alliance, this marriage of convenience with ISCAP and um, with the uh, Islamic State Central, Central African province in, in um, mid-2019, and really this marked change in strategy and tactics from sort of late 2019, early 2020, which I think, well, except for probably really good analysts has taken a lot of people by surprise. And that's what we're seeing now and the sudden interest in this, um, in this now and, and people seeing this maybe as, a, as more of an ISIS dominated um, insurgency rather than understanding the local origins of where it, ca where it came from. And what we see maybe is, is, is there seems to be some engagement now with licit and illicit economies, um, very likely as, uh, as a need to, to raise funds. So what we hear things about are around the ruby trafficking, around potentially um, artisanal gold. We hear that recruitment is when people are being recruited, um, they're being told that they can earn money from um, gemstone trafficking, from artisanal gold trafficking. But I think a lot more work needs to be done to, to understand this. Um, I'm just gonna shoot through this. So in terms of kind of the conclusions and recommendations from what, what I'm talking about, um, really what we've seen, I mean, broadly away from the extremism, extremism, extremism we're seeing high value wildlife products have just become another commodity being trafficked out of Africa by organized crime networks. We're seeing wildlife environmental crime play a major role in the breakdown of governance and rule of law. Um, and that has allowed extremism and conflict to flourish. Um, and then secondarily, these are potentially being used in funding conflict as well. Um, what I've seen, what we see work successfully with wildlife crime in some of these challenging areas is, is when we move the focus from anti-poaching to actually tackling the organized criminals and the networks to building investigations and cases for prosecution and aligning with local concerns, then we get somewhere. When we focus on anti-poaching alone, stopping people entering somewhere and shooting something, then we run into trouble because we alienate local people. Um, on, in terms of the, the sort of second set of recommendations, and this is really from, from talking to, to people on the ground and some of the work that, that I saw happen in six years really focusing on wildlife crime, is we need to build long-term support for local governance systems, not national, to some extent provincial, but really it's a, in, in Northern Mozambique, it's district level that we need to be working on, on governance. We need to build effective and trusted local law enforcement. And again, we saw that work in some instances. So that can help reestablish the rule of law. But what's critical in that is building the social contract between citizens and law enforcement. Um, 
And I believe we need to build and support community resilience. And, and what do I mean by that? I mean by that so that within communities, there are support networks um, and we reestablish or establish the social support structures. So that might be social welfare systems, it might be whatever it may be, but that gets, that helps build the networks and the contacts between communities. That's it from me. Thanks, Alistair. That was a, a really fascinating presentation. I think a great sort of taxonomy of all the different illicit revenue streams that are active and operational in Northern Mozambique is quite daunting. Um, and some succinct recommendations in terms of focus on local governance. Um, I, I think in the q and I'll be interested to hear perhaps your, your um, um, sort of reflections on what the recent capture of Mosimba de Praia that port um, and I, on August 12, and I, from what from what I've seen, it's still not actually effectively being retaken by Mozambican security forces. What that means for um, Osuna getting a, 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 a deeper control of those illicit revenue streams associated with the port. Um, but I know we we pushed for time, so I'd like to uh, turn over to our um, discussant, Dr. David Matsina, uh, who who's the head of the um, Southern Africa head for Amnesty International, um, and he's going to um, provide some feedback on the discussion and, and um, how it relates to um, Northern Mozambique. David? Hello. Um, so, um, uh, thank you very much, Stephen. I just want to uh, correct that I'm, I'm not the head of Amnesty International. I am um, um, the research specialist for Lusophone countries which includes Mozambique and Angola. Thank you. So for me, uh, the, the strands that stick out in all of these presentations, uh, beginning with, with, with Richard, um, with terrorism and organized crime nexus, uh, Charles, you know, with um, the liberations on the um, um, Horn of Africa, you know, terrorism over there, and Alistair, organized wildlife and illicit trade and the collapse of governance in, um, in Northern Mozambique. What stick out for me in all of these presentations is the trans, transnationalism nature of all these uh, criminal activities. Although they are situated in specific territories and countries, there are vast transnational networks of criminality of trade, whether it's arms, whether it's funds, whether it's all you know sorts of goods that are being um, um, you know exchanged in between the different um, uh, groups that are operating in their jurisdictions. Now, these are transnational networks that are operating in the shadows of the states in which they are they are located uh, in the shadows of the law. That was very clear. Now, however, for transnational networks of crimes to expand and flourish, there are necessary conditions within states, the bounded territories that must be met. One of them, which all of them have mentioned is the porosity of borders, which undercut you know, the sovereign argument that states often make. And this relates very well with the problem of uh, armed attacks that we see taking place in northern Mozambique. The whole coast of Mozambique, a little over 2,000 kilometers of the coast, most of it is porous, remains unguarded. And um, as Alistair noted, you know, there's a lot of drug trafficking taking place along the coast. So, you know, that's very pertinent when we think about uh, the situation in Mozambique. The other question is the corruption of, of government officials. I remember one instance is that one instance I was reading a correspondence between a case um, of corruption between um, government officials in Mozambique and you know these um, a company, it's a Brazilian company that specializes in building airplanes. And one of those executives was saying, you know, it's very easy to corrupt government officials in Mozambique. They are very cheap. Uh, that speaks, you know, to the depth and breadth 
of corruption in Mozambique in all institu institutions at all levels. And we see that also as a condition of possibility of what is happening in Northern Cabo Delgado. We also see the precarity of political conditions within the country. And at this moment, I would like to enter into um, you know, an argument of human rights. It's poor governance or lack of governance when it pertains to human rights. These are abuses and violations that we have seen taking place when we speak at civil and political rights. Freedom of expression in those countries are not respected. That's true in Mozambique. Freedom of association is not respected, is not protected. Freedom of assembling, the media freedoms, the right to information, and all those necessary conditions that enable citizens to be active and participant uh, actors in the political systems. All those things are, are very um, defective and citizens feel alienated. They feel alienated and marginalized. They cannot identify with political institutions. They cannot identify with the leaders and they cannot identify with all those institutions of governance. When it comes to economic and social rights, we see a great deal of unemployment or underemployment, poverty, inequality. Those are the root causes. The right to food, the right to water, the right to housing, the right to health, the right to education. All of those rights are undermined. And when we speak of human rights, I would like to say that we should think of them as all the necessary conditions for people to live dignified lives. And, and when we look at the situation, at the conditions in Mozambique, we can see that human rights are being undermined at all levels in Mozambique. And that's very true uh, in Cabo Delgado. There's a lot of historical factors that speak to this uh, deteriorating conditions of human rights, some of which have been mentioned. We also see the inability of central authorities to acquire and maintain the monopoly over the means of violence, as well as taxation. In all these presentations, we have, we have heard that these groups and these criminal uh, groups, uh, they are able to set up their own taxation system which is a privilege that should be limited to government, to states. But we, we see that in this case, this is not happening. We also see that the very fact that they are armed and they are able to, uh, to stage attacks in Northern Cabo Delgado, for example, it's a clear indication that the government, the state, the central authority lacks control or monopoly over the means of violence and taxation. So these armed groups, you know, set up, you know, parallel uh, taxation systems and also uh, systems of um, armament, you know, trading and operations and, uh, and so forth. Now, the problem that we have here in terms of responses, we see that these are transnational organizations that have no respect whatsoever for the ideas of sovereignty, for the ideas of non-interference, and the idea of um, mutual respect that govern the relationships between states, uh, especially here in Southern Africa and in, in other regions. However, in their responses, these governments, still operate in these ideas of sovereignty, non-interference, and respect for territoriality, the same principles that are being violated. And it does not occur to government officials that these borders are imaginary. They've been invented and they can be de-invented at any moment, if I could use uh, um, that word. In the map that um, in the map that one of the presenters um, uh, 
uh, demonstrated here and showed us, I think it's, it was Alistair, you could see those trade routes. You can barely distinguish the borders between the countries in which all these, you know, uh, the transnational networks of crime crimes are operating. So one of the things that um, um, I believe uh, in our discussions we should factor into, one is the governance of human rights. As I was saying, human rights are all the necessary conditions for human beings to live dignified lives. And the second issue is the relationship between these states, which are still based on the outdated ideas of sovereignty, non-interference, and um, you know, bounded territoriality, which are not being respected. We need to find new ways of responding to this so that you know, the governments are held accountable to protect human rights so that people will not feel the need to join any criminal activities to express their grievances and to make a living. And also to respond effectively by exchange of information and collaboration between the different states. It's high time for the AU, for SADC to begin to look at the issue in Northern Mozambique, not as a problem of Mozambique, but as an African problem, as a SADC problem, and treat it as such, get involved. Uh, that's where I will stop. Thank you. Oops, sorry. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. David Machine. Um, I really couldn't agree more. I think um, what all of the presentations have highlighted and, and, and which you really emphasized is how this conflict should, and, and our reaction to it in Northern Mozambique so late, um, should really call for the need for a complete re-evaluation, I think, of the our African Union peace and security architecture, how those norms are governed between states, um, and whether it's actually fit for purpose to react to, to addressing incredibly complex uh, conflict systems that rapidly emerge, that overlap between political and criminal um, motivations. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, I'm going to hand over to, to Bethany now and uh, to, to moderate some Q&A. Hopefully we got the uh, Q&A uh, function sorted. Bethany? Absolutely. Thank you, Stephen. And thanks to all of our panelists, this, uh, I was going to say this morning, but if you're not here in the morning today uh, for their excellent contributions, this was very rich. Um, you know, we've received a couple of questions in both the chat and the Q&A. Um, at this time, I'm going to take a little bit of moderator prerogative. I actually um, was very interested in a point that our colleague Anne Moison brought up about the, the repeated highlights of Gulf interference uh, versus the, you know, focus that U.S. and other partner and ally countries seem to have on the great power competition, specifically highlighting Russia and China. So at this moment, I'd like to bring in uh, Susan Stigant, who is the Director of Africa Programs at USIP. Um, she's on our, on our uh, agenda today for providing final reflections um, based on this conversation, but I think, you know, given the richness of the discussion and a lot of the intersections within the questions, um, now would be a good point to hear from her as well. Um, so I'd actually like to start on that question, Susan, if you don't mind, and then bring in the rest of our panelists to also discuss that. The role of the Gulf states, both in the Horn and to what extent this influence extends down into Mozambique, either within the illicit or illicit um, economies, or perhaps um, more as part of the regional security cooperation and security governance initiatives that are taking place on the Eastern Seaboard. Thanks, Bethany. Um, it's been really interesting to hear uh, the perspectives of our panelists, and I, I look forward to hearing their thoughts on what the US and the EU and others should be doing in relation to this policy. Um, USIP has been looking at the Red Sea arena, um, and particularly how the in increased um, and intensification of the political, economic, 
economic and security engagement by Gulf countries and the Horn is impacting on peace and security, particularly in this moment of the really fragile transitions um, in Ethiopia and Sudan, in Somalia, the ongoing civil conflict in South Sudan, anticipated elections in Kenya and Uganda, and then this developing and, and Tanzania, and, and then the developing complexity in Mozambique. Um, and, and I think what I can say from the perspective, um, I think the panelists really covered well the risks that, um, that the, the engagement that takes place risks overlaying with existing polarization, that it risks breaking, breaking apart and um, undermining the objectives that I think many um, international partners have for stability and long-term peace. Um, and what, what we are, we're doing right now is we've convened a, a senior study group of um, American policymakers, assistance providers, folks from the defense side to, to develop an analysis of what this, what this problem set looks like and, and present some recommendations. Um, we anticipate that that report from the senior study group will be out in the next month or so. But essentially, um, I can tell you that, that the, the first problem is that, that, that typically we think about these as separate geographic areas, as separate political, as separate peace, as separate probably criminal areas given the conversation today. And then there's a need to, to look at the interconnection and to connect those up who are doing the analysis on, on both sides of the Red Sea, right? Lots of people think of the Red Sea as a border, but in fact it is a bridge, an increasingly busy uh, bridge. Um, the second recommendation that we've looked at is, is what architecture is needed in U.S. policy in order to facilitate those, those connection points um, so that you don't have um, an assistant secretary looking at the Middle East and North Africa and somebody looking at Africa and then the, the dynamics allowing things to fall through the seams of those two. Um, and then the third is to really look at um, opportunities to ensure that assistance um, and that Congress is appropriating funds and giving attention to these issues in a, in a shared sort of way. And so a light way to do that is, is to have, you know, shared congressional hearings and um, shared requests for information. Um, a broader way to think about it is are there issues that cut across, um, whether it's related to water? Um, the Nile River Basin issue is one that's, that's really agitating, I think, and pushing on some of these questions in the Red Sea at the moment. Um, or whether there are areas for opportunity of, of cooperation, whether it's in the, the green and the blue economy um, or beyond. Um, so I really actually defer to, to our panelists in terms of how this plays in Mozambique and, and look forward to, to learning more and hopefully continuing the conversation beyond here. Thanks for bringing me in. All right. Any other honored panel want to speak to perhaps the role that the Gulf countries do or don't play in some of these licit and illicit economy streams that I think Alistair ably highlighted in his map? So I might just say a few words. Um, so the, you know, the, the historic relationships that we see are not, um, I don't think, really play out the same way. So we see that relationship of trafficking from the Macron coast of Iran and, and um, Pakistan, basically. And we see um, human smuggling in those connections, these, these old trading connections from Somalia and all the way across um, to the Macron coast as well, and even, um, even further to India um, and Sri Lanka. Um, but in terms of the, the modern political um, entities that exist there in the, in the Gulf states, um, less so in, in the, that involvement in illicit economies. Now, I think that there is, from what I hear, there's, there is a lot politically going on, um, and certainly the relationship with Turkey um, has changed, um, but I'm not able to speak to that. So just from the illicit economy perspective, that's really where we see um, these relationships, you know, the ability to, you know, the, for tons, sometimes tons of heroin to flow um, with the, the money, to be transferred either in advance or later shows deep trust between the different peoples partaking in that trade. And Dubai seems to play a role in the middle of that, um, where we see people traveling to Dubai, um, and sometimes with gold. Um, and so that's on, but that's, that's speculation. Let me be clear, that's not really recorded. Um, but there definitely seems to be deep trust. But again, that's out with the political entities that, of modern states. Thank you both so much. Looking to another kind of set, I think, of interrelated questions that are here in the Q&A. 
Um, first, this one comes from Leanne Erberg Stedman, also at USIP. And this is not a USIP bias. These are actually just the questions in the chat. Um, you know, the question was asked, what have we learned about the, the intersection between these transnational organized crime groups and you know, our kind of conventional terrorist groups that we can really apply back down to, to Mozambique. Are there any models for our interventions in Somalia that can be applied in that space, given uh, some of the issues that were, that were raised are very much around governance, around legitimacy of governance, both the national and the subnational level, and also histories of marginalization within specific populations. Um, I'm aiming this at Charles to begin with, um, but open to all, and especially Dr. Metzina as well. Hello. Uh, yes, um, I can come in on this. Um, I don't know whether I should respond to the more specific question that I see uh, came from Leanne, Leanne Edberg's statement. Is that the question that uh, I should address? Yes, sir. Yes, okay, thank you. Yeah, I think Leanne uh, wants to know, uh, since the Horn has experienced many permutations of violent extremism, what have we actually learned about the dynamics and the changing nature of terrorist groups, which can help us to better understand? Well, one of the things that we have learned is uh, uh, that political agitators uh, can easily uh, emerge uh, from a, a, a situation where there are already uh, failures of uh, governance, democratic uh, deficits, and underdevelopment. So one of the lessons is, of course, that governments should uh, improve their capacity. And this is where both the, the domestic level the incumbent regimes at the regional level, neighboring governments, and at the global level, the international community has a role to play to strengthen the capacity of uh, the sitting governments to neutralize the ambitious political agitation that tends to spur on violent extremism. There are various ways of neutralizing political agitation, uh, but to just put it in very brief terms is to really steal their thunder, identify the reasons which uh, popularize their agitation. What is it that really uh, enables them to attract uh, the support of uh, uh, violent extremists uh, to their side? Uh, in various places, whether it's Uganda, uh, South Sudan, uh, Somalia, uh, Ethiopia, the agitators that eventually became warlords in those countries built upon a groundswell of uh, grievance that had developed because sitting governments were simply not delivering uh, on what they should deliver. So that's really a key lesson that we have learned. So I think it's a very basic lesson, but uh, it's a lesson that needs to be emphasized uh, again and again. Um, whether the international community uh, can actually help to combat terrorism while at the same time increasing the rule of law, observance to the rule of law, uh, because these are not two competing uh, aspirations. They are in fact complementary to each other. Uh, if the rule of law uh, together with the development uh, are delivered, then terrorism will correspondingly also be, uh, I think, uh, suppressed. Uh, when we talk about the international community, as far as the Horn of Africa, perhaps Mozambique uh, equally so. We should really distinguish between the regional states and the global international community. 
there is much more that the regional states should do than perhaps what the global international community should be expected to do. It is the regional states that should play a very important role in holding incumbent governments to certain standards that they may have committed themselves uh, to, specifically in respect of the rule of law, in terms of delivering on development commitments, uh, even develop, delivering on uh, the sustainable development goals. The, there's an important role for the regional community of countries around the troubled states to actually play a much more uh, effective role than perhaps the global international community in the shape of, say, the United Nations or the African Union even. It's a lot more distant. I would just stop it, stop at that. Um, perhaps if I might, before you speak, Dr. Mitsunye, one thread I want to pull there on the idea of, of, of regional ownership and local ownership ties back to some of the successes that Alistair highlighted on the, you know, combating illicit trafficking front, which actually brought in some great collaboration between both external and internal actors. And so this question is also drawn from the Q&A, but you know, it appears there's, there's perhaps a capacity imbalance um, within the state actors, um, very much on kind of the, you know, security and anti-crime aspect versus the, the governance, human rights, and what would probably fall into the PCB aspect. And so my question to, to everyone is outside of, you know, external actor support, be they INGOs, uh, you know, other partner nations and other multilateral organizations, how can we improve the capacity or strengthening the willingness of nation states to leverage some of the internal capacity they have towards these, the, towards improving PCV outcomes in the same way that they seem to be experiencing successes on the anti-crime standpoint. All right, thank you. Um, one of the um, you know, outstanding issues that I have seen in the, um, prevention or fighting, you know, terrorism is, you know, the discourse itself, uh, you know, the labeling of, you know, certain groups as terrorists, which actually deals with the symptoms of the problem, because we look at the violence, the beheading of people as, you know, the problem and the people perpetrating those, you know, heinous acts. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the deeper underlying issues that have driven, you know, such individuals and groups to engage in such acts are barely looked into when, you know, these um, strategies are designed and implemented to, to, to stem back the, the, um, the, the problem of terrorism. Now, in Mozambique, in Mozambique, we know very well that Cap Delgado has been disenfranchised for a very long time. That is why locals often use the word Cabo Eshkesid, which means the forgotten Cape. They've been forgotten for a very long time, which created problems of underdevelopment. The most shocking instances of underdevelopment, poverty, and inequality that you will see on the planet. You will see them also in Cabo Delgado and other Northern provinces. And these have developed and worsened under, you know, an existing government that has been operating for almost five decades. We're talking about 45 years now the government of Mozambique is attracted to the idea um, of terrorism and combat, combating terrorism because it absolves them from the culpability of the extreme conditions of poverty that they themselves at least have presided over or they have helped to create this reserve army of unemployed, um, uneducated, at least in terms of formal education. And these young people cannot even be absorbed in the current and growing uh, industry in, in mining in that area because they have not been equipped with the skills. And that is the excuse 
that is being made of it. So whatever interventions that are put in place, we need to learn from the past lessons. Look into the root causes. We need mechanisms that at the same time will hold the government of Mozambique accountable in terms of respecting, fulfilling, and promoting human rights, which they failed for four decades to do. The government of Mozambique has gutted all kinds of accountability. The civil society is under stress, is being persecuted, and you know, all these interventions are very necessary, but we need a, a component that looks at development, at holding um, also the government of Mozambique accountable. Because if we just empower the government, you know, to use the means of destruction better, to kill more insurgents, you will have more insurgents joining the ranks, alienating the people, aggravating the problem. For me, that is um, one of the outstanding lessons that I have seen, and I think mm. it is applicable in the case of Mozambique. Thank you so much, Dr. Mencine. And you know, we're we're now at time, and I find myself regretting that we cannot have these meetings in person because it's much easier to stay in your seat with an accessible bathroom and coffee and perhaps a snack or pastry or something. But you know. Hopefully, the conversations that we had here today will spur a subsequent series of, of conversations focusing on Mozambique and the broader region. Um, you know, I'd like to invite Stephen for any uh, last words on the behalf of DGA. Um, but from my part, thank you all so much for joining us, and um, we look forward to next we meet. Thanks, Bethany. Uh, no, thank just, you, uh, just to appreciate my uh, show my appreciation to all of the panelists. Um, really, really interesting insights today. You know, um, we will be capturing this in the report, and um, I think I can already see some some pretty concrete um, recommendations. And and it would be great to keep this discussion going, um, whether in a formal or, or informal process, um, as Bethany mentioned. But um, again, thank you to the panelists. Um, to resolve um, and to everyone who joined us today. Um, thanks. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. It was great. Thanks. All right. Have a great rest of your day. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, Bethany. That was really interesting. Yeah, no, as I said, there's really never a